Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's discussion on race, racism, and disease. Alan and I are so thrilled to have the incredible group of speakers we have today. I just wanted to take a moment before we introduce this wonderful group just to speak a little bit about um, the importance of today's session. I think as Alan and I conceptualized this course, we really, it became very clear to us early on that we needed to address this moment really through the lens of race and racism in our country, because it's really essential to understand this moment in that context and also what this moment is teaching us about our own humanity. As, as um, many of us have discussed, in many ways, there is an analogy to the HIV pandemic when it exposed the underlying challenges that the LGBTQ community faced in our country. And in similar ways, COVID is really exposing the centuries of wounds that have been inflicted on people of color in this country and now has provided in a way a singular lens for us to focus on race and racism and addressing these issues. And so it's in that context that we're having today's session, um, but also an awareness that we have attempted and will continue to attempt to thread this throughout the course, that this is an ongoing discussion and that we welcome the exchanges that we've had with you all and appreciate this dialogue and feel so fortunate to have these four speakers who are joining us today, who have dedicated much of their, their entire life's work to addressing these fundamental issues. And we're so grateful for their presence. So I'm going to hand this over to Alan to introduce our speakers. Thanks, Ingrid. I just would underscore what Ingrid has said. I've, I've had a sense that We've talked about a lot in the course that epidemics, pandemics reveal the most basic and serious fault lines of a society. The language has now become familiar to you. Epidemics lay bare every aspect of our culture, our society, and especially inequalities. And um, that's been true from the beginning of the COVID pandemic. I sometimes have had a sense over these recent weeks, it's like somebody turns on a light in a room that is completely dark. And there are things that have been invisible to us, even though they crucially affect everyone every day. And then the light goes on and it's hard to see. But for at least a brief time, you have the possibility of opening up the most serious questions um, that confront a society and politics around issues of justice, equality, and especially injustice. And that's been profoundly true of COVID-19. And when Ingrid and I were planning, there are many excellent experts in this area who have actually devoted their careers to studying these problems. But their work has incredibly powerful resonance in the context of the pandemic. And we were able to get some of the people who, honestly, we admire most in the world um, to participate in the course today. So I will briefly introduce them. We want to leave a lot of time, or as much as we possibly can, um, for you to make comments or ask questions. The first speaker will be my colleague in the Department of the History of Science and my boss. She's chair of the Department of the History of Science. She also is a professor in the Department of African and African American Studies here at Harvard, a former Dean of Harvard College. And I would just say about Professor Hammond's work she has throughout her career illuminated strategies for how to think historically and in contemporary ways about the category and the concept of race. And I invite all of you to explore her work on gender, race, 
sexuality. Um, and I think it has particular immediate relevance for how we understand COVID-19. So it's great to have Professor Hammonds here. Our second speaker will be Dr. Margarita Alegria. And Dr. Alegria is a leading expert on health disparities. She's the chief of the Disparities Research Unit at the Mass General Hospital. And she has devoted her career, especially to understanding how to correct and reduce and fundamentally end health disparities that are based on race, ethnicity, and culture. Her work is especially notable for um, bringing strategies for community involvement in improving health services to people who have had difficulty of access and are, are fundamentally underserved. The third speaker will be Dr. Sonia Shin. She's a colleague of mine in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School. And she's um, active in the division of global health um, global health, what is the term? Global health equity um, at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. But what's so impressive about Dr. Shin is that she has spent her la the last decade working in the Navajo Nation, building collaborations and um, with tribal leaders and the health teams there to um, help develop new strategies, especially with community health workers for improving the health of a, you know, greatly underserved community. And I couldn't help but think as we were preparing for today's session, you know, the combination of expropriation of labor through slavery and the expropriation of land are at the very center of any understanding of American history. And so we see those issues in our speaker's work um, in a fundamental way today. The last speaker will be Dr. Kamara Phyllis-Jones. Um, I very fortunately got to know Dr. Jones very well over the last academic year. We were fellows together at Radcliffe's Institute for Advanced Study which not that many undergraduates have contact with, but it's really one of Harvard's remarkable units. And it brings together people from all disciplines. And I have to say, Dr. Jones's curiosity and intensity of learning, not to mention her remarkable expertise in developing new and testable and effective strategies for anti-racism was really at the center of our discussions at Radcliffe. And I invite all of you to take a look at her work. She's a former president of the American Public Health Association. She's a family physician and an epidemiologist who I say with some gratification trained at our um, School of Public Health here. She's associated with Morehouse School of Medicine and Emory's School of Public Health. And it's really fantastic to be able to welcome her here today as well. So now I will turn to Professor Hammonds and I wanna thank all of you for being here today. Thank you, Alan. It's really wonderful to be a part of this course. It's just absolutely fantastic. And I'm happy to be here to just share a few of my own uh, thoughts and insights about uh, what's going on as we've uh, as we are living through this pandemic. So first thing I want to do is uh, share my screen. So of course um, uh, we're talking about uh, confronting COVID, science, history, and policy. Um, the first thing I just wanted to reiterate what um, uh, what Alan said opening up uh, today's class. From my perspective, also as a historian of science and medicine. Uh, it's very clear that pandemics don't produce inequalities, that they reveal them. 
And there are two crises that have defined the summer and late spring of 2020, and that was the escalating police violence and the worsening pandemic of COVID-19, and both have disproportionately targeted communities of color. Um, and so while I think the, the killing or maiming of people of color by state authorities is far more visible in certain respects, the extraneous failures in healthcare and public health are actually much more numerous. And I think that the privatization of healthcare and the failed policy decisions by the government have really led to persistent stark racial disparities in health that we are very aware of. And I think the pandemic has revealed and exacerbated some of those disparities. So just to, to say some of the data, and I think other folks will be commenting on this as well, uh, Black and Latino Americans are roughly two to three times more likely than their white counterparts to con contract the coronavirus, roughly four times more likely to be hospitalized by it, nearly three times as likely to die from it. And of course, I think Maggie's gonna talk about more about what happens has been happening in the, in the Latino and Latinx community. Um, and I think that uh, it's important to note at the outside, outset that uh, doctors and scientists who track these case counts and death tolls are, are pretty horrified by this disparity. And many worry that the true gap is probably even greater than the, than the data indicates. And we are facing some, some numbers of, of death and, and illness at numbers that we've never, um, that we have not seen for a long time. And when I think about what's been happening in, in African American communities and the kinds of explanations that people have been offering for the disproportionate impact of COVID. Um, and it's been described by a number of factors. The first one, high rates of existing chronic diseases, diabetes, hypertension, asthma, and, and obesity are among them. Greater likelihood of, of African Americans uh, being uninsured and thus have le having less access to health care. More exposure to the virus due to holding more low-wage jobs and food services and public transit and hospitals and other public-facing jobs. Decades of discrimination and distrust leading to avoidance of the white-dominated healthcare system. Uh, in the beginning of the uh, pandemic, uh, there were rumors on social media that Black people were less susceptible to the virus. And there were also rumors that Black people were more susceptible to the virus due to biological, to what some people perceived as biological differences between the races. And I'll come back to that point. Uh, other people have pointed to structural inequalities in health, wealth, housing, and education. And I would have to say about all these points that um, there are elements of each of them that I have observed uh, in, in discussions and reports of every outbreak of epidemic disease in US cities that I've studied since the 18th century to the present. But the thing I want to call your attention to, to think about this, these issues um, historically, is really centered on this, on this chart. And if you look at the first uh, chart A, it's the, the age-adjusted mortality on a logarithmic scale, and it goes from 1900 to 2020. And as you can see, the light blue is, uh, are, reflects uh, African-American age-adjusted mortality. And the, and the darker line uh, shows the white mortality rate. And you can see from 1900 to 2020, there has never been a time when black mortality has been less than white mortality rates. That is a significant and important backdrop and background for me, particularly as a historian, to understand and begin to ask questions about. And, and the basic most important question here is why? Why has this kind of difference in disparity in mortality rates existed for well over a century? And actually, it's probably earlier. We don't have the data. Some of the data prior to 1900 is not as robust, but we do know that there were dis disparities in that moment as well. And then life expectancy is on the other on, on the other chart, and you can see as well the ways in which um, a black mortality a life expectancy. Uh, has been lower than white, uh, again, from 1900 to 2020. Um, and the roots of all these disparities are, and that's my, my dog, and I will see if I can, uh, if, she, if he will not 
try to participate in this conversation. Uh, but the roots of these disparities are difficult uh, and, uh, and deep and they're hard to disentangle. It might be that the, the presence of greater chronic illness might stem from diet or lack of health insurance, but that doesn't really explain for many of us um, uh, why Black and certainly uh, Latino Americans are more likely to suffer from issues of food insecurity or to work in low paying jobs in the first place. So to answer these questions, you have to dig deeper into housing, immigration, education, labor policies that date back to the nation's founding and actually um, really report point to specifically issues of systemic racism. So let me tell you why I think history matters. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll raise these points and we can talk about them more uh, as in the discussion. We have to understand, first of all, as historians, what happened at the end of slavery when almost a million African-Americans uh, who had been enslaved were free. How did they survive? How were, how, what kinds of situations did they face? We have to continue to analyze the failures of, a, of the federal government during re, the period of reconstruction right after the Civil War, when this, this, this newly enslaved population had very little housing, very ac little access to jobs, very little uh, uh, ways to provide for themselves in the economic system of the United States at that time. We also historically have to look at how theories of racial difference provided a natural explanation for in re restricting Afri African Americans access to jobs, to education, to economic opportunities, and adequate housing, and how those things affected their health status. These are the crucial sets of, 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 of points that we have to look at historically to understand the two charts that I showed you earlier. Um, we also have to look hard uh, at and demonstrate how public health practices beginning around 1900 that were focused on keeping whites separate from blacks who were viewed as sources of contagion for many outbreaks of epidemic diseases uh, that emerged uh, early in the 20th century. And then if you start in 1900, but you can get to 1981, 80 years later, when one historian uh, wrote a, in a quote that I, I like to use a lot, that um, he was trying to understand what he saw as the disparity um, uh, between white and, and, and blacks and causes of death. And the point that I, I really want you to look at, and he was saying in the 1980s, it was even then uh, still hard to understand why um, the, the, the differentials persisted, had persisted so long up to that point. And he noted, and he thought about it and said that basically what he observed is that in North Carolina, when he, when he was writing about this, um, and every other Southern state, he found that African Americans lived outside of every legal, medical, and social advance our nation has made in this country. That's 1980. And that, and, and, and that tells us something about what had not happened between 1900 and 1981 when he was writing. And so this history then, uh, I have to say, um, is, uh, matters a great deal. And in the end, the need to address the systemic racism that the history points to, um, we know should be a part of the mandate of public health. And having a historical perspective that can tell us where we've been, how we have, as a nation have failed to incorporate lessons from previous epidemics makes it difficult for us to understand what is happening and the disproportionate impact on African Americans right now. And I'll just close with a, with a comment that another one of our colleagues wrote over 20 years ago about the importance of history. Because it, the history tells us, as he noted, the extent to which racism, and racism is this sort of fluctuating, shifting in content, but ever present aspect of American life is still a major public health problem and a challenge to the goals of medicine um, and science. Um, the failure to address racism is one of the things that the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed. Um, and he noted that it reflects an abandonment of racial justice and equity as national goals. It's not just history. So we can understand the disproportionate impact of COVID on African-American communities without 
going back and doing and answering some of the historical questions that uh, we have not fully answered and it makes it hard for us to explain persistence of uh, the disproportionate impact of disease on African-American communities. Thanks. Thanks, Evelyn. You've really given us a great sort of historical platform and foundation for understanding so many things that are characteristic of, of this moment. Let me turn now to Dr. Alegria. So thank you. If you could start with a slide. Thank you so much for having me. It's uh, an amazing honor to be with this panel. Um, I want to say that um, you're going to hear a lot of the topics that Evelyn brought. It's good, they're going to be repeated because I think, as you will see, uh, there's a basic uh, theme in, in probably our four presentations, and it's a history of dispossession that has uh, really uh, been uh, rampant in communities of color. Let me start, uh, I was asked to talk about the Latino X community, but you'll see how much overlap there is with Evelyn's presentation. Next. I wanna start by saying that people, uh, when COVID hit, uh, there was a lot of, you know, talking about ethnicity or race being the risk factor for disease. But actually, as Tom Sequest said, it, that's not the risk factor. The risk factor is racism that we see over and over again. This is not new, actually. People that have done, like Evelyn and others that looked at the history, Spanish flu was the same. Uh, there's been a history of all of this epidemics being especially in communities of color. Let me go next. Let me talk about the Latinx and I'm gonna skip over some of the uh, uh, things that Evelyn mentioned because we already know that Latinx are more likely to test positive even though they were tested at the same rate as uh, whites. Uh, they're more likely to be hospitalized, four times more likely. They are uh, disproportionately burdened by chronic disease. And even if you look, I think the most serious things that I wanted to talk about is age-adjusted COVID-19 death rates for Latino is 2.5 more than whites. Astronomical, this should be race as a tragedy. And there are 53 more times to die than whites. So everywhere you look, you can see that it's, it's really a, a very serious problem for the Latinx community. Next. I want to show you also how it's not only been the mortality and morbidity, it's been the financial devastation of Latino families. 42% of Latino families said they've gone through all their savings as part of the epidemic. Then you see one of the things that's very unique to the Latino families is a heightened sense of fear, uncertainty, and great threat that has happened because of the anti-immigrant rhetoric that we're suffering. The public charge has made it that people are afraid to even go and quarantine in hotels, for example, in Chelsea, because they're afraid their families are going to be evicted if they find out they're uh, positive. Second, they find out that their families are going to be separated if they find out that they're undocumented. So even in things like quarantine, we couldn't get people to be able to move if they were in a family and were infected to a hotel because of the fear and the associated anxiety and depression that we have seen for both Latinos and Asians and especially immigrants with small children. Next. I also want to talk, like uh, Evelyn said, and you would see that this is going to repeat many of the things, but three areas that are very pertinent to Latino communities. One is the residential and housing insecurity, particularly because Latinos tend to live in very overcrowded family environments, many multi-generational uh, because of the cost of uh, living in, in, in these urban areas. So for example, if you look at California, 18.4% of Latino families 
live in overcrowded household compared to 2.4% of whites. Look at that disparity, this is huge. Segregation, racial housing segregation, linked to asthma and other conditions also puts you at higher risk. And then I wanna talk about one of the things that they found very early in the COVID epidemic was what they call the vulnerability index of higher rates of deaths and hospitalizations that CDC created. And it tells that place matters. And those places uh, that have that high vulnerability because unemployment rates, high transient, overcrowding, all of those places are gonna have higher rates of deaths but we're not talking about ethnicity or race. We're talking about the conditions under which we put communities of color. I think the second thing I wanted to emphasize is this residential worker status. Latinx are disproportionately in essential jobs that don't have very good benefits, that have low wages. For example, Latinx workers in essential uh, jobs are 80.6% compared to 76.7% of whites. They have less options to work remotely, dramatically less options to work remotely because of the types of jobs they do. They also are more likely to have, even within the same institutions or stores, to more likely have unstable work schedules. So they can't even plan. Imagine the anxiety that this brings under the conditions of COVID. Lastly, I wanna talk about access to health insurance. Latinos are three times more likely to be uninsured than whites. Three times more likely. 41% of the people who were receiving health insurance coverage and lost it because of their jobs, 23% of those were Latinos. And if you're particularly undocumented, you face additional bigger uh, obstacles. And one of the things we saw very early in the COVID epidemic is many people send you to a website, but actually that website was very informative. It just was not in Spanish or uh, other languages. So people were finding that they were being sent to information sources that were not they were not able to access. So just to put those three on the front. Next. I think the other thing that you're seeing is the stress. The stress is particularly serious for Latino communities. Uh, according to an APO national poll, they're the highest undergoing stress. They only, the Latinos not only represent, like I said, the proportion of those in a session, high proportion in essential jobs, we also see that they are one of the hardest hit by job loss. So imagine, I mean, Franquilo did a great meta-analysis of what happens when you have such an effect of a recession or people lose, lose in mass jobs. And the hit is gonna be on mental health and, and substance abuse, because imagine coping with the stress of not being able to actually provide for your family. This combined with the anti-immigrant rhetoric that has affected so many families. And as uh, Evelyn was saying, the Black Lives Matter violence that we are seeing, you know, Black Lives you know, movement that had to come up because of the struggles of the Black community, I mean, all of that confluence of factors really raise, you know, a situation where people find it overwhelming to cope with their everyday lives. Next. I want to show you uh, a very nice work that was done by the Commonwealth Fund, finding who are the respondents who reported experiencing stress and anxiety or great sa sadness that found difficult to cope with their own since the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And you can see here, Blacks and Latinos, again, very high, women, very high, and below average income, you know, you can see super high. So again, we see this perpetuating factor that we have done the perfect storm for this populations of color. Let me go to the next slide. I wanna call, uh, call attention to children because this is one of the areas that I feel it's uh, 
really, really serious and we should pay attention because these children, we're putting them in a position that's long lasting. We see increases uh, as have been reported in worse mental health outcomes, uh, substance use and elevated suicidality because all of the problems we're finding in food insecurity, family conflict and severe poverty that these families are experiencing. We're seeing that we children, mostly Latino and African-American children, get most of their mental health when they need it through schools. And we're finding that with the school closures, these this children do not have an outlet. Same thing for emerging adults. We're having serious, serious issues with emerging adults that can get jobs that don't know how to their uncertain future in terms of their academic and, and career outcomes, and we cannot offer them a lot of help. So this, this is an area about disruption, food insecurity, lack of resources to attend to children and youth, and the emerging adult population. Next. I also think that we're seeing that with the parents having so much instability and hardship due to COVID, this is going to increase the likelihood that these children have adverse events uh, that can be tied to PTSD and, and, and their child development. And I wanna emphasize that this is not families are not doing well, they're really resilient. The issue is, you cannot undergo cumulative stress day in, day out, and not break down because it's just too much. I also want to uh, emphasize that there's a loss of a generation of elders that in our, our communities of color play a very substantial role for children. So they're really also losing a lot of connections and support by their elders. Next. I want to finish by mentioning a few of the uh, what I think could be policy recommendations because I think we need to increase the investment. This is a time to invest in social services, especially with the determinants of uh, social determinants of health to really build up those communities that are in such need of resources. And we know we could identify those communities with all the information we have. We also need to uh, actually expand federal regulations. We have to make them easier so we, we, can we can provide novel behavioral health treatments that are right now restricted under certain guidelines, uh, but that address the unemployment and the COVID anxiety. I also think we need to have innovative models of care. For example, Celia Falico has talked about the importance of student clinics that really take students out to the communities to see what's happening, open that bubble to see how the struggles of our communities of color. And then I think we need to integrate rather than disaggregate mental health, addiction, and infectious disease under a public health strong, strong model of care that really looks at the whole community rather than specific individuals. And hopefully we can accelerate the training of our workshop. We have a lot of knowledge on our community health workers, our peer uh, advisors, and how we can build community capacity to do the best just job possible. Thank you so much and looking forward to the rest. Thank you, Dr. Alegria. You know, there are so many crucial points here. We will take them up during the questions. I would just make one observation, which is we tend to think about COVID-19 in a very limited biomedical context among how do you get it, then what can happen to you, how do you avoid it. But the ramifications in communities of the pandemic are profound. And the harms, and of course, there are tremendous harms to patients and to um, the tragic losses of the pandemic, but the, the concentric circles that you, your talk represents of the harms of a pandemic and how they're revealed is just one of the most powerful things I think we can learn. The other thing is there's things we can do, and I think that's a crucial element about 
how, how we think forward. So now I want to introduce Dr. Shin. It's really great to have you here. And she will give us a perspective that I think is in so many ways um, consistent, regrettably, with stories from our African-American communities, our Latin, Latinx communities, and of course, one of the most profound underserved and exploited populations in our history are those of um, Native peoples. Thanks, Alan. I hope that you can uh, see my screen. Yes. Okay, great, yeah. great. So um, it's just a, a phenomenal pleasure to be uh, part of this panel. And so I'm going to try to um, not do justice to a very broad historical arc in six to eight minutes. <laughs> so I think when I was uh, reflecting on what uh, we have been through with COVID um, and uh, trying to sort of like uh, lay this roadmap um, out to all of you, there are, I think, some very unique aspects of tribal health systems that are probably just worth laying out from the beginning. So some of you might have heard of uh, the Indian Health Services. This is actually um, a federally run, federally funded um, healthcare system similar to the VA, the Veterans Administration. But unlike the VA, actually, um, <clears throat> the tribal healthcare system, Indian Health Service, actually um, has its origins in treaty rights, which means that it's, it has a very different relationship because we're talking about contractual, legal, and moral obligations of the US federal government to provide comprehensive health care to indigenous citizens of the United States. One of the things that actually I think is an, an, an asset to the tribal health system is um, that public health has actually been baked into those treaty rights and to that health system package from the very beginning. So public health nurses have been around since the early 1900s and um, uh, paid community health representatives uh, since um, the 60s. And I think that's actually something that has really um, been um, a very important aspect uh, when it came to uh, the time of confronting COVID. And the last thing that I think it's just impossible for me to talk about tribal health systems without discussing this is this notion of self-determination. And I'll come back to this in a different context later, but actually, you know, some of you might be familiar with the fact that um, uh, in the mid seventies, um, the federal government put into public law um, this self-determination act, which allows tribal uh, sovereign governments to actually run their healthcare. Um, so what that means is that they can actually get the federal funding, but rather than have the, you know, the IHS actually provide the healthcare, um, they would actually use those fundings to, uh, to deliver health care to their, to their communities. So no matter whether it's a um, tribally run health care system or an IHS system, what we can recognize is that across the board, not surprisingly, um, IHS is uh, chronically underfunded uh, compared to other health care systems. So what this sort of sets as a stage, you know, pre-COVID is, a, um, for instance, here on Navajo Nation, is actually, you know, a healthcare system that's got some assets, but is, you know, very understaffed. So in some places, for instance, you know, the vacancy for nurses is like 70% um, in, in Navajo Nation, um, and a, a, actually a pretty complex um, system with both a tribally run and federally run um, facilities that are all trying to kind of interact. So, that sets the stage and then COVID came along and um, some of you might be familiar with the media because I think uh, Navajo has been <clears throat> um, uh, highlighted quite a bit um, over uh, the past few months and um, Navajo Nation was hit hard and it was hit early. Uh, so you can kind of see that we peaked in May and um, I think you know one thing that's actually kind of interesting is that um, the, the, the leadership of Navajo Nation actually took it upon themselves. They knew that this was going to be, you know, highlighted in the media. So they made sure that their own narrative was in there. You know, so President Nez actually was very proactive about not only, you know, sort of um, speaking publicly and making sure that it was his narrative and not an imposed external narrative, but also enforced um, very, very aggressive uh, public measures to put into effect uh, quarantine, travel restrictions, et cetera, to the point where now, um, uh, you know, it has been actually uh, um, acknowledged as a possible model that um, other communities could, could learn from across the United States. So um, I think one, uh, you know, again, like one important thing is to recognize um, that uh, Navajo Nation was very proactive about uh, taking on COVID and was very unflinching. <clears throat> 
But if you think about why were we hit so hard, um, you know, it, we've talked already um, from, um, you know, some other populations about uh, some of the underlying um, health risk factors that predispose to greater rates of um, um, uh, poor COVID outcomes. And we know that um, uh, chronic diseases such as diabetes, um, obesity have been disproportionately represented in uh, Navajo Nation and other American Indian communities. But if you start to ask like sort of the why behind that why, you know, why is that so? Um, very quickly, we start to confront the structural challenges of uh, inequalities to the, you know, and I actually sometimes, you know, I, I forget that this is sort of the context that I live in where one in three households might not have access to clean water and the rates of food insecurity are among the highest reported in any U.S. population. But then, you know, if we want to ask the why behind that why, <laughs> uh, very quickly it goes to some of the historical um, um, U.S. federal policies um, and um, uh, commercial interests that have been extremely extractive uh, in terms of diverting water sources. And this map here with the little red dots actually represents the abandoned uranium mines, um, which uh, have still to this day, you know, largely not been cleaned up and have contributed to challenges in terms of being able to um, have, you know, exercise true sovereignty and have, you know, um, food production um, in a thriving way on, on, on Navajo Nation. Um, and in parallel to these uh, sort of land and environmental um, uh, uh, injustices, there has also been, you know, I would argue a very systematic policy of the federal government over the past several decades to basically um, c uh, disrupt the cultural continuity of um, indigenous communities, including uh, forced relocation and the introduction of Western diet in those moments, such as a long walk on Navajo Nation, uh, boarding schools where children were forcibly removed um, from their families. And um, now uh, when they've come back to you know, live um, in their communities, it's been challenging because they haven't received the teaching, the language um, you know, from um, their elders. And you know, even to the modern day, I would say that some of these colonial practices are um, still um, uh, you know, uh, um, experienced. And you know, it, it's not just the federal government, but private industry, as you can see from the pervasive uh, strategic marketing of uh, sugar sweetened beverage industries in communities of color. So um, why does this matter? <clears throat> well, this is actually uh, one of um, uh, my favorite uh, groups of um, um, researchers um, at, that have shown that cultural continuity, the ability uh, to exercise self-determination in terms of like how you control your land, your education, and health systems are protective. You know, these are protective um, um, structures um, that are associated with lower rates of suicide and diabetes in First Nations communities in uh, Canada. So we know that like this ability for um, indigenous communities to practice self-governance and to sort of protect their traditions is actually a profoundly um, an important um, factor. And yet ironically, you know, those same protective uh, factors have been um, vulnerabilities, right, in the moment of COVID where uh, communities are actually, you know, our, um, our um, Navajo patients have a very, very um, uh, strong uh, network of not just their nuclear family and the multi-generational households, but also the clan system, which connects um, extended families. And so, you know, most weekends, for instance, uh, you know, grandma would be visited by like, you know, an auntie or a niece or somebody else to just check in. And they're, you know, it's an incredibly mobile uh, community where those uh, connections uh, to each other as relatives are really one of the most important um, things that defines uh, their, 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 their social fabric. And that has, you know, those are exactly the lines of transmissions that we've um, identified in our epi links um, in the process of contact tracing. So I kind of just want to take this moment to sort of pause and reflect that when we talk about social determinants of health, you know, social means that these are constructs, these are societally man-made um, phenomena that can either be detrimental or can be protective. And I want to acknowledge the complexity of both the, the challenging, you know, and the positive aspects of social determinants of health that we've seen play out in the moment of COVID. And just to close, I, you know, we, I, like personally, I've been doing a lot of work. I'm, I'm uh, uh, part of the incident command for contact tracing and happy to talk about that 
but I, you know, I wanted to just give this example of one of the areas where um, um, we've been working, you know, uh, with the Navajo Nation um, as an example of, you know, if COVID is this revelatory moment that has sort of laid bare these longstanding um, uh, institutional um, uh, uh, practices of racism and colonialism, you know, it's also, I think, a moment to use COVID as a wedge to drive for equity, you know, and not just to say, okay, we're going to like just get by and we're going to deal, but actually to argue, um, to advance, you know, so that your public health system is actually stronger coming out of COVID, um, you know, and actually has overcome some of these underlying long-term um, um, uh, structures of inequality. And so there's a, um, a, a movement among indigenous uh, researchers for indigenous data sovereignty, which really you know, is founded in this principle of self-determination. And this notion that data uh, doesn't belong to an individual, it belongs to a community. And so you can see Navajo Nation actually sits on three states. So imagine what it's been like, you know, especially early in the pandemic for Navajo to have to wrangle just like, you know, basic data on who's getting COVID in their community when they actually had to get it through three state systems. And the states were, you know, varying, but pretty passive around how that information was shared. So early on, uh, the Navajo Epicenter made the determination to actually use a single platform, you know, to, to track COVID and are now using that, uh, that data, you know, um, in real time to, to make their policy decisions, as, for instance, you know, um, gating criteria on how to open up um, uh, the community. So I just wanted to kind of point to that as uh, an example of exercising uh, self-determination and data sovereignty. And just to close uh, by acknowledging, you know, the ingenuity um, and the resilience of, um, you know, many of um, uh, the partners that I've had the chance to work with and to acknowledge as well uh, the many, many families who have been affected by COVID. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Shin. That's so important. I can't help but be struck, you know, again, from a biomedical or even a traditional public health point of view, we talk about data, but how we collect the data, who has the data, what the data means, has been so crucial to how we understand this pandemic and social inequity in general. And I think that's such a, a critical point. Um, I want to turn now to Dr. Jones, who has been thinking for a long time in a very concerted and meticulous way, how can we reduce racism? How can we identify it? How can we address it? And how can we be anti-racist? And so it's a real pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Jones. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brandt and Dr. Katz. And um, I will share my screen. So um, all this morning, and I know earlier in the course, we've been about naming racism. I want to, my contribution to our more, this morning's conversation is to equip us with a communication tool uh, for naming racism, because there are four key messages that we need to get across in this time and going forward and not falling back. The first is that racism exists. The second is that racism is a system. The third is that racism saps the strength of the whole society. And the fourth is that we can act to dismantle racism. So I am going to approach uh, this task with one of my allegories, one of the teaching stories that's based on something that I saw in my own real life. This one, I call dual reality, a restaurant saga. And the moral of this story is that racism exists. Even if your whole life experience has screamed that this is you know, the land of equal opportunity. So the story is based on an experience I had as a first year medical student. So come walk with me. As a first year medical student, I was very diligent, of course, very studious. And one Saturday I woke up early and what do I do? I hit those books and I hit them hard studying well into the afternoon and then some friends come over and do they distract me oh no so all of us get to studying long and hard and now it's getting late and we're getting hungry and i have no food in the apartment which was quite typical of me so my friends understood they said never mind kamara let's go into town and find something to eat so we do 
So we walk into town and we see a restaurant and we walk in and we sit down and the menus are presented and we order our food and the food is served and here we are eating. And so you, you're like, Dr. Jones, that's not a very illuminating or remarkable story about racism. Oh no, not yet. But as I sat there eating with my friends, I looked across the room and I noticed a sign that was a startling revelation to me about racism. So now maybe I've intrigued you and you're like, Dr. Jones, what did the sign say? Oh, okay, what did the sign say? The sign said open. So now maybe I've lost some of you. So let me recap. Here we are sitting in a restaurant eating. I look across the room, I see a sign that says open, thinking no more about it. I would have assumed that other hungry people could walk in, sit down, order their food and eat. But because I knew something about the two-sided nature of those signs, I recognized that now indeed the restaurant was closed due to the hour, but firmly closed. And that other hungry people, just a few feet away from me, but on the other side of that sign, would not be able to come and sit down, order their food and eat. And that's when I recognized that racism structures open, closed signs signs in our society, that racism structures, if you will, a dual reality. And for those who are sitting inside the restaurant, at the table of opportunity, eating, and they look up and they see a sign that says open, they don't even recognize that there's a two-sided sign going on because it's difficult for any of us to recognize a system of inequity that privileges us. So for example, it is difficult for men to recognize male privilege and sexism. It is difficult for white Americans to recognize white privilege and racism. It's difficult for all Americans to recognize our American privilege in the global context. But those on the other side of the sign, those on the outside are very well aware that there's a two-sided sign going on because it proclaims close to them, but they can look through the window and see people inside eating. So back inside the restaurant, to those who ask, is there really a two-sided sign? Does racism really exist? I say, I know it's hard for you to know when you only see open. In fact, that's part of your privilege, not to have to know. But once you do know, you can choose to act. So it's not a scary thing to name racism. It's actually an empowering thing to name racism. It doesn't even compel you to act, but it does equip you to act so that if you care about those on the other side of the sign, which is an if, but if you do, why you could even talk to the restaurant owner who is after all inside with you. And you could say restaurant owner, there are hungry people outside. Why don't you open the door, let them come in. You'll make more money and oh, the conversations we could have. Or maybe what you'll do is pass food through the window or maybe you'll try to tear down that sign or break through the door. But at least what you won't be doing is sitting back saying, huh, wonder why those people don't just come on in and sit down and eat, because you'll understand something about the two-sided nature of that sign. So this is the story I tell when I have four minutes to convey to a group of people that yes, racism exists. It's creating a two-sided or multi-sided sign in our society. It's structuring a dual or multifaceted reality. And of course, racism is not just the sign. It's the sign. It's the door. It's the lock. It's all of these structures and communicate all of these value assessments. It's all of that. And I actually started a three hour conversation once in Flint, Michigan with, after just telling this story, four minute story, with the question, how could people who are born inside the restaurant know something about the two-sided nature of that sign? And it was a three hour conversation because there are many, many ways to know. What I have to say right now is that I'm heartened that more people who've been born inside the restaurant have an inkling in these past few months about the two-sided nature of the sign. First of all, with the COVID-19 pandemic, ripping the sheets off of structured, structural racism in our society. And with the very public lynching of Mr. George Floyd and people before and people after, that we are now aware. People who are inside the restaurant understand, maybe the sign flipped for a minute. And I say, this is great. I am heartened that there are more people who instead of saying, what are those people outside saying? Black lives matter? Don't they know all lives matter? Well, now more people are saying, are affirming that, for example, black lives matter. More people are putting together the words structural racism.
systemic racism. But my warning to all of us is that if we just say a thing, put out a declaration, make a statement on our website or whatever, it's important to say the thing. Naming racism is essential. It's necessary, but it's insufficient. But if we just say a thing, then six months from now, we may forget why we said that thing because the seductiveness of racism denial in this nation is so powerful that six months from now, if we just say a thing, we might fall back into what I describe as the somnolence, the sleepiness of racism denial. We must act to tear down the sign, dismantle the lock, take the door off the hinges, because if we start acting, we won't forget why we're acting. So very quickly, I want to just race through my uh, definition of racism. I've said the word a few times. We've been talking about it all morning. When I say the word racism, I'm clear that I'm talking about a system. So I'm not talking about an individual character flaw or personal moral failing or even psychiatric illness, as some people have suggested. And it can manifest in those ways. But in its essence, it's a system of power. A system of power of doing what? System of doing two things, structuring opportunity and assigning value. On what basis? On the basis of what we call race, which is the social interpretation of how one looks in our race conscious society. What are the impacts of this system? Well, when we think of racism at all, we recognize that racism unfairly disadvantages some individuals and communities, but every unfair disadvantage has its reciprocal unfair advantage. So racism is also, un all, you know, also unfairly advantaging other individuals and communities. And that's the whole issue of unearned white privilege that we hardly ever talk about in this country because it makes some people some people who are living as white, especially uncomfortable. And I used to apologize. I used to say, if you feel uncomfortable, shake it off. I'll tell you some more stories. I don't say that anymore. I say, if talking about how racism unfairly advantages other individuals and communities makes you uncomfortable, lean in. I encourage you to lean into that discomfort because for all of us, the edge of our comfort is our growing edge. But there's a third impact of racism, which is that it saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. And so rounding around to the bend, of course, there's so much more I would love to talk to you about. In fact, I would say that my, the national campaign against racism that I launched four years ago as president of the American Public Health Association had three tasks, to name racism, to ask how is racism operating here, and then to organize and strategize to act. So what can we do today? What are kind of the, the classifications of, of types of actions we can have? First, going back to the restaurant, we need to actively look for evidence of two-sided signs. Is there something differential going on here by race, by language, by ethnicity, by immigration status, by sexual orientation, by zip code, by urban, rural, by anything, religion, all. And we need to look not only at differences in outcomes, but also differences in opportunity structures. We cannot be reassured that, oh, looks open to me. Oh, no. We need to burst through our bubbles of experience to experience our common humanity. Each of us lives in a bubble of experience. Most of us do not recognize that just across town, there are people who are just as kind, funny, generous, hardworking, and smart as we are, who are living in very different circumstances. We need to burst through our bubbles to experience our common humanity in different circumstances and then build common cause. We need to be interested in the stories of others and then believe the stories of others without requiring cell phone video, and then join in the stories of others. And I'm heartened that many more people are doing that these days. We need to develop a sensitivity to the absence of, because it's through, you know, who's not at the table. We need to understand who, what is not on the agenda, what policies are not in place that have put in place could be quite productive. And we need to reveal inaction in the face of need, because that is the way that structural racism most often manifests these days, lack of action, inaction in the face of need. But all of the power and the stuff is not on, you know, only on the inside with the people who are sitting inside the restaurant eating, right? Those of us on the outside need to know our power. We need to recognize that action is power, and especially that collective action is power. So, you know, I wish I could have my usual two hours. I know I don't, so I'm going to stop sharing, and I look forward to all of our questions. Wow, thank you. Thank you all so much. This has been a phenomenal, phenomenal group. And I have to just say, Harvard is so lucky to have you all. I mean, really, we are, we are blessed to have you in our, in our session today, but Harvard is so lucky to have you all.
on their faculty. And I know for the students in this class, I've seen a lot of um, messages in the Q&A about how grateful they are to hear your voices as women of color in this moment, lifting up the voices of so many and addressing these critical issues in our country right now. And I just have to say how deeply grateful Alan and I are to have you here. And um, I'm really addressing, as, as Dr. Shin said, the why behind the why. What is the why behind the why? What is our history? What is our humanity? What is our role as researchers, as physicians, as public health advocates, as historians? This is the moment that calls upon all of us. And I think, and I hope for our students here today, you've had a chance to take this in and reflect upon this work as you continue to move forward, as you continue to educate yourselves about all of these issues. Many of you have already had scholarship in this area. And I encourage you to read the work of these uh, four great leaders as we now turn to questions. So again, I wanna thank you all. And I'm gonna pass it on to our students, really, who have um, quite a few wonderful questions. Thank you. <laughs>